1 through 8 last week. We are in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and verse 9 is where we will pick up. And we will pick up with a point that we left off with. Last week we left off with those who would pursue success to the extent and with the tunnel vision passion that's, that that's all that matters, nobody matters, nothing else matters except their success in getting to the top. And, and we kind of mentioned a little phrase we've heard before, it sure gets lonely at the top. And that's the way it is for some. And so that led into a talk for a few moments at the end on loneliness. And, and that led into us considering how we all need one another. We're not to be Lone Ranger Christians. We're, we, we need each other. And that's going to be the primary topic as we finish out the chapter Tonight, we all need one another. And so we pick up in verse 9, and we're going to talk about loneliness. We're going to talk about togetherness. You know, and what's come to my mind in the last week or so concerning this is, it's funny how your thoughts can go from one thing to another, and then you connect it with what you're preaching. But fall festivals coming up in about nine weeks or so, and there's... Something there. There are many things we do to prepare for fall festival. One of those things is uh, taking care of the ant hills that we find throughout the grass and yard. That that that'll make quite a mess. So so we look to 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 destroy the ant hills, and and the way we do that is by killing those little annoying creatures that make the ant hills, the ants. You know, you might get one ant bite here and there, and, and you can handle a single ant bite. That's, that's really not a big deal. Just one isn't going to affect us much. But if you have ever stood in an ant pile barefoot, they're, they're trying to send you packing. I mean, they get a hold of your feet and your ankles, and they start going up your legs, and... And they make quite an impact when they gather together. They, they don't make you feel very welcome when you, when you step into their house. Their combined effort is much greater than any singular effort of any one. Not only will they send us packing, but, but they will gather together and they will rebuild what our feet destroyed in probably about 36 hours, they say, on the average, uh, to build their house back. Ants don't get lonely. Ants latch on to one another. Let's look at this idea of loneliness, or maybe the cure for loneliness, if you will. Let's look at the loss of loneliness in verses... 9 through 12, and the first thing I want us to consider is if there's no intermingling. If there's no intermingling. It says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. You know, you've heard the saying, in the privacy of my own home. You've used that before. And there's good reason to use that. There's appropriate reasons to use that. Our homes ought to be our sanctuary. There's family business and there's uh, events and there's things that, that you just don't air out from outside the home. You keep things in the privacy of your own home. That is a good saying. That's a saying that should be used in many cases. But when we get to this idea of privacy... You know, many times, especially today, that's very abused when we consider privacy. You know, because people seem to be fine these days if they never have to leave the house and go around anyone else. Um, 
You know, and that's very possible for a lot these days. There's this working remote today, and and don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing that. Uh, that. Sometimes that's the only way you can get a job. The position only offers you to work from home, and, and some people like it, and that's great, and, and, and that's fine. Uh, you know, that's the only way some folks will hire you. But to find all of our enjoyment, all of our entertainment, all of our interaction behind our front door... Uh, you know, there, there's, there's an issue there when it comes to loneliness and being around one another. A lot of people can, can just stay in their own home with Facebook and Instagram and, and all of these things and Roku. And, you know, that gives us, uh, this is what I'm going to say about that. That'll give us a busy life of loneliness. And I say that because there is nothing that will replace personal interaction. I think Facebook fooled some people for a while. And don't get me wrong, there's, there's good uses for that. A lot of connections are made that you might not connect with people in any other way. And, and there are many great things uh, to use it for. I, I've had people through the years try to encourage me to get one. And I thought about it, and it, it just never happened. And, and now some of those same people are saying, don't get it, don't, 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 don't do it. And, and I don't know what that, all that's about. I can guess uh, kind of maybe what they mean, but, but I mean, you get the idea. Nothing, nothing takes the place of in-person communication. I, I taught from this book nine years ago. And I only look back on some notes whenever I'm, I'm looking at something that's, that's just kind of deep and, and I'm studying it and I'm, I'm wanting to help myself out because I'd studied before, so I'll glance back. And, but for the most part, I'm not. But when it comes to this verse, I remember something that I said nine years ago when I taught it, and that is, I can remember every name of everyone on the block I grew up on till I was 16 years old. I, you know, it's been a long, long time since I've been there. And I remember everyone that lived there, not nine other families on the block. And I remember their names. I could tell them to you now. But not only that, I could add to what I said nine years ago. I, I was thinking about it and I remember six families from the next block. I thought about my whole little neighborhood and, and, and I went, house to house almost, and, and I remembered 27 more families. That's over 40 families in a, in, a, in a neighborhood of about 80 houses. I mean, if I didn't know someone in the neighborhood, someone I knew knew them, pretty, pretty safe place in a lot of ways. You know, and I, and I just say that to say that there was so much more personal interaction before. Something's happened in the last 40 years, and especially in the United States, especially in big cities, and that's just a little more isolation, a little, little more privacy than, than we ought to be having, if you will. I mean, every place on this earth isn't like it, but, but we see a lot of it here, and, and we need to take a, an example from the ants. Not only what it says in Proverbs about, about how the ants aren't lazy at all, and we need, we need that, but how about the coming together as the ants do? It makes sense because we need one another. We're not meant to do this on our own. We will come out better in every way, every time, by being with one another. There, there is a loss that happens by no intermingling. But let's also consider no insulating in verse 11. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? Most of us have never been in a situation where our survival depended on another person being there because of the cold. 
so we could have someone to to make heat with, you know, to be to be close together with so we don't die. It, I, has, has it ever been a matter of life or death for anyone here? Mo- most likely not. Uh, I could tell you my dramatic story from Bluebell. I, I've been over in the back of a truck that was 20 below zero, and my back, it, it kind of went two directions at one time, it felt like. I dropped what I had in my hand, and I laid down on the floor. And about 30 seconds later, I tried to move, and I couldn't. And you don't think 30 seconds is a long time, but when you're thinking you can't move and you're 20 below zero, it kind of gets scary. And I laid there probably about seven or eight minutes before I could move. And the thought of being in that cold and that happened, that was scary. There's there's another story of a guy who went in the back of his truck. He was a bigger guy than me, really strong, a fellow named David. And he shut his door, and the way you open those doors, you had to kick them open. And he had his side door locked, no going out that door. He went to kick that door, and something happened to the mechanism, and he could, that, that big, strong man could not get out of that truck. He knocked on that door for two hours, and somebody passed by, finally heard something, looked at that door, figured out how to open it, and David was able to get out. He called his bud. There, were, there was no being macho in that case. He called the boss and said, hey, I need to go home. I'm very shaken up. I couldn't get out of that truck for two hours. I, I, but overall, I just don't think we've had many personal situations where we needed someone there to make warmth, or, or it was a matter of our life and death. It has happened. It's happened many times before. You know, the cold can be dangerous, and, and so we're considering this warmth that that is being spoken of, and the heat, but... But as we think about that word warm, there, there's something very cozy about that word warm. And there, there's something about it, it'll make you think about a relationship, a good relationship, whether friendship, marriage, or whatever, and, and the warmth that's there. I'm not saying that's the primary meaning or has much meaning at all in this, but we think about that. We think about that in relationship with one another. There's a warmth that keeps us from a coldness or a loneliness when someone else is there. And it keeps us from having to be alone. It lifts our spirits when we have another, when someone else is there. You know, there, there's a beauty in relationships there's a beauty in marriage that, that many need to, to look to the creator of marriage and see how wonderful marriage is that God has created. You know, all kinds of people in all kinds of relationships do not consider the warmth that is meant to be given in that relationship. I tell you what, we need to slow down and we need to realize what's meant to happen in, in, our, in our intermingling with one another, the fact that we have one another, the fact that we gather with one another, the fact that we know and have a relationship with one another, there's warmth that is meant to give. It's not just meant to be waited on to receive. It's something that we're to initiate and to contribute to and supply in our relationships. And we ought to do so without expecting a return. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's so sweet to, to have it reciprocated. It's, it's so sweet to have a relationship back and forth where there is love that is shared. But I say we ought to initiate it, not thinking of a return. And, you know, just thinking about relationships and, and warmth and how that comes about. I, I think about a preacher who preached our camp one time. And I might have told this story in another aspect of it one time, but, but I remember him talking about his daughter going to school, and there was another girl, it was her first day of school, I believe it was elementary school, and, and this girl's sitting and crying on the bench. And this preacher's daughter goes up to her and says, why are you crying? She says, well, I'm brand new to the school and I don't have any friends. And the little girl's... Words were simply, I'll be your friend. 
And that was the very beginning of a long relationship. She, she was like another kid in the house in some ways. There was the preacher, his wife, the daughter, and, and she had a brother. And, and so this daughter has this friend, and she knows the whole family. And they all grow up and kind of go their separate ways in, in some ways. And, and this girl that was befriended, she got into some kind of Christian ministry where they were ministering to people under bridges, homeless people. And this son of the preacher, he, he got on drugs. He was sticking dirty needles in his arms underneath, uh, underneath the overpasses where he was living with other people. And along comes this girl who was befriended in ministry to minister to people like that. She ran into him and recognized him, told him who she was, Long story short, the Lord used her to help him to get his life back in order with the Lord Jesus Christ, and then they ended up marrying. All of that started with one girl walking up to a brand new girl who was crying and saying, I'll be your friend. There's a, there's a warmth, there's, there's an insulating that happens whenever we... We, we let the walls down and, and we open up and, and we have interaction with one another. But if there's no insulating, there's, there's no warmth. Can't do it on our own. Let me go to verse 12 and let us consider no infantry. Verse 12 says, And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. I say no infantry because this is help for the fight. My father, my father told me a lot of stories toward the very end of his life. He never told me throughout his life. But he, he got in a fight with a taxi cab driver one time. And my dad was getting the best of him. And uh, he thought he had pretty much whooped that taxi cab driver and that, that driver somehow made it back over to his car and grabbed a hammer out from underneath his seat. And he started beating my dad with a hammer. And, and he might have killed him, but my dad's brother and my dad's cousin came back after my dad hadn't shown it. They got out of the cab and they went on. And when they didn't see my dad, they came back and they were able to be on my dad's side. And help him out with that. And my dad lived to tell that story because of it. When he was by himself, he got himself into a lot of trouble. But then the brother came back and, and that made things a lot better. He had him on his side. And it was even better when his cousin got back and he had him on his side. You know, we can't all relate to a physical fight, maybe. I haven't had one since the Lord saved me. But in another sense, every single one of us have been in a fight since the Lord saved us. We're talking about it on Sunday morning. We're talking about these spiritual battles and the warfare that we're all in. And though the battle is the Lord's, sometimes the way the Lord wins the battle is by another one of His children in our lives. Maybe maybe two more. Maybe several more. Fellowship with Christians in our lives. And if one prevail against Him, two shall withstand Him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken." Someone showed me how to take rope and to, and to take it and, and take, take that rope apart and there's three cords there and, and to weave it into the rest of the rope. And I did that and, and so that loop you had on the end, no matter how hard you pulled it, it just got stronger under pressure and it wasn't breaking. I took a rope of one cord a while back, and I pulled a, a broke down golf cart with it. Less than a mile, I snapped that rope about four times. 
And I, I just kept, kept having to tie it together. I thought that thing was going to be right up against the bumper of the car with the, how short my rope got because I kept having problems with just one cord of that rope. You know, two cords make the rope much stronger. Three, even stronger than that. What's the point? We're much stronger together than we are individually. We need each other. We think about the Apostle Paul, and we, we really kind of single him out when we talk about him. And we consider the, the greatest servant for the Lord Jesus Christ that ever walked this earth. I don't think any of us would argue. We believe it's the Apostle Paul. He didn't do that by himself. He wouldn't have been what he was. And he wouldn't have served the Lord the way he did without other Christians. He says of Epaphroditus, just a little mouthful about his friend Epaphroditus. He says, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier and he that ministereth to my wants. Barnabas. Barnabas was that encourager who could give a jump start when somebody needed one. And that's exactly what he did with Paul. Barnabas went to Paul and he encouraged him in a time when he needed it. Paul wouldn't have been what he was without other Christians. He was just one cord and he wasn't near as strong without having the fellowship of the brethren as he has, as he had. God gives us one another to help in the fight. There, there's, a, there's a loss in loneliness. But let's, let's look at a lack in long term here. And we're going to try to keep this simple in this part. Look at verses 13 and 14 with me tonight. It says, Better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. For out of prison he cometh to reign, whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor. The, the more words I use to try to explain this, the more confusing this might get. You have, what do we have here? We have a poor and a wise child, and we have an old and a foolish king. And, and we have something positive said about the leadership and the authority taken by the poor and the wise child who was in prison, who had, who came from trouble. And then you have the negative said about the old and the foolish king and him being in the position that he's in. The old and foolish king became king by his name. You know, by his heritage. By, you know, he, he didn't become king by who he was. It, it was just the, and what he did, it was just the, the, the family he was in or, or where he was at the time to be, for that to be able to happen. And seems to be quite a dictator. Somebody who did things all by himself. Refused to hear any other thoughts. Rejected any counsel and any wisdom that might be given to him. And he failed. He is an old and foolish king. Most people, the older they get, the, the wiser they get. That, that's my experience with people. But, but there are some who, doesn't, who do not learn from their experiences in life. What, what, they need, what they're able to learn by it, they just, they just don't. It reminds me of the sermon I heard, kind of, uh, Babies with whiskers and old men in diapers. 
and, and the growth of some Christians, the growth of some young Christians very fast, and then some just don't ever seem to grow throughout their life. But this king it, it never learned from his experience and never became wise. But this poor child, this poor child is wise, and he came out of troubles and poverty into his reign, and he became wise by the very trouble he experienced part of his value uh, as a king came from his experience through troubles. Let me let me tie that up this way: troubles made a, a man a better king than one with a silver spoon given to him. Verse fifteen, he says, "I considered all the living which walk under the sun, with the second child that shall stand up." In his stead. We just need to simply consider by this that no man's reign upon this earth, no man's authority upon this earth, and whatever position, it's not forever. We just need to consider that that reign is going to come to an end for, for all men. And I can't help but interject what came to my mind as I thought about that. And that is, there, there is an exception to everyone's reign ending. The reign of our Lord Jesus Christ on His throne is never going to end. His throne is to all generations. His throne endures forever. His dominion and glory and kingdom that, that all people should serve Him. His dominion is everlasting, the Bible says. His dominion will never pass away. And His kingdom shall not be destroyed. Revelation in chapter 5 and verse 12 says this of the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and the twenty elders fell down and worshipped Him that liveth forever and ever. Revelation 3.21, the words of Jesus, it says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in His throne. The, the throne of authority for, for man upon this earth, it's always going to end. And, and, and I just couldn't help but think about our Lord Jesus Christ and the everlasting eternal throne that He has, the eternal life that He has given to you and I, something came up recently, and I, and I have planned to put together for one in particular member scripture and an explanation from scripture that tells of the eternal life, the never ending life that Jesus Christ gives us whenever he saves us and an explanation of it to them. His throne, His rulership. He, he's King of kings and Lord of lords, and it's forever. And that's a good place to finish the chapter right there, but we're going to go ahead and go to the last verse. Verse 16, it says, There is no end of all the people, even of all that have been before them, they also that come after shall not rejoice in Him. Surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. We just can't get over King Jesus 
some 2,000 plus years later as, as our King and our Savior. He's our King forever. But what it's talking about here, again, is any king upon this earth. Any, anyone with the authority in such a position that they may do well. They may do well for a while, but another generation is going to come along and they're not going to be so impressed. This is vanity and vexation. In other words, the, the abuse of authority, the thought of authority and, and on the throne by yourself, you can just do all of this and do all that. Well, one day it's going to end. It's not, it's not going to last forever. No matter how good it is in leadership, it's not going to last through an entire generation. It's, it's always going to come to an end for man upon this earth. And so, these are the things that Solomon has dealt with and discovered in this world. The, 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 the vanity of, of self-pursuit and the danger of loneliness and, and the vanity of, of power and, and, and abuse of it in such a way, it's just going to fade. It's not going to last. And so with that, we are going to close Bible study tonight, but something we're going to do tonight that we do every now and then on Wednesday night is have a time of invitation as the Lord might be speaking to your hearts uh, for for whatever for whatever he's impressing upon your heart to do, so let us bow to the Lord in a word of prayer and then have a time of invitation. Father in heaven, Lord God, we do humble ourselves in your house tonight, and Lord God, help us to understand your word and and to consider the examples, consider the experience that that you had Solomon to, to give to us, Lord, that we might see the things that are vain, the things that are empty in this world that do not satisfy, and that we might look to the one who does satisfy, the one who gives true contentment. I thank you tonight for your precious son, Jesus Christ. I thank you for his power to defeat our sin, our, our death, our hell, and our grave, and to be to be raised from the dead, Lord, and, and to give us victory, those who trust in Him as Lord and Savior. And we love you for this tonight, and we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for an opportunity to worship you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If y'all would like to please stand tonight. 433.